All right, it's time for some post show science. Um, I there was no post credit stinger, so don't worry about that. Um, and even though we got a few minutes left in the voting, it feels like The Rock is a runaway winner. I think so. I don't think anybody can catch it at this point. So, and it's about time. Uh, we're gonna start off with a, um a little bit of what most what happens with many Mel Brooks movies is that they get adapted into musicals. So I want to give people a taste of what young Frankenstein looked like when it got adapted into a musical. That's Frankenstein. My name. It's pronounced Frankenstein. You must be Igor. No, it's pronounced Igor. I kind of feel bad that I never saw this. Welcome to Castle Frankenstein! I am the housekeeper. I think it lasted How that long. Ever, so. No, because I think it was quite terrible. Sorry. what I, the reviews are. I don't wish to embarrass you, but I am a rather brilliant surgeon. Perhaps I could help you with that hump. What hump? I'll say that Mel Brooks said that he really enjoyed this movie, or this music, so for whatever it's worth. It's an hour and a half movie. Most musicals are like three hours-ish, at least two and a half. So like, what the hell did they pad this out with? All right, I want to start with uh, the medical school uh, lecture at the top, and I'm going to read uh, what Gene Wilder mentioned. This so-called brainstem consists of the midbrain, a rounded protrusion called the pons, and a stalk tapering downwards called the medulla oblongata, which passes out of the skull through the foramen magnum and becomes, of course, the spinal cord. Well, just a, a couple of years... What, sorry, go ahead. No, I said, of course, it becomes the spinal yeah, cord. Yeah, of course. And uh, I love that uh, in this letter to the editor um in in the in the lancet that uh we we got a a response that's called putting on the ritz and they talk about the uh, misconceptions of neurology that appeared uh in this movie uh so i'm gonna give you an all too quick brain anatomy lesson and by lesson i mean with the quality that you came to expect from frankenstein uh so basically the cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres. I think we've all heard that before. The two sides of the brain are connected by something called the corpus callosum, which is a bridge of flat neural fibers that help relay signals between those two hemispheres. The hemispheres are further subdivided into four major lobes. The occipital, which is towards the back. The parietal, which is just above the ear. The temporal, which is just between the temples. Um, and the frontal resting above like the eyes at the very front of the cortex. Uh, generally, when neuroscientists talk about the lobes, they're doing so to denote a general anatomical location of brain activity. But these areas also tell us a little bit about function. Um, and I really mean that a little bit. So like the occipital lobe is mainly responsible for processing and interpreting visual information. It's a seat of the primary visual cortex but there's whole networks of neurons that work together that cross these, these kind of geographic boundaries. Uh, the temporal lobe is, is generally considered a major area for processing uh, sound and some forms of memory. Parietal lobe is, is home of the soma, somatosensory cortex, uh, which is about processing sensation and touch. Frontal lobe is the most complex part of the brain. This is what separates us from other uh, primates to a certain extent. It's responsible for decision making, executive function, reasoning, planning, even um, you know, execution of, of movement. Uh, but then these lobes, they also have pleats of them, these folds. And the uh, these folds, the um, they're different in each of us. Uh, and the outer bump of all these pleats in these folds is called the gyrus while the groove inside of each fold is called the succulent uh, the sulcus sorry no um no two brains fold exactly the same way but they have some common features and each fold has its own name as well uh the lateral sulcus for example 
is the uh, inner fold that separates the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe, and its neighbor, the temporal gyrus, houses the primary auditory cor cortex, which is what processes sound. The brain's most basic working unit, if we get below all of these sort of um, organ level functions, is, is the neuron. We've all heard of the neuron. The neuron's quite similar to other cells in the body, but have specialized branching extensions off of it called dendrites and axons. It's those extensions that allow neurons to communicate with, with each other through synapses. Synapses are these small gaps between the cells where chemical messages are exchanged. It's, be, it's the different sections of neurons that make up the two types of brain matter, white and gray matter. Gray matter it consists of the cell bodies and the dendrites. White matter is made up of the neurons axons, uh, which has a myelin sheath on it and a fatty insulation that helps cells communicate more efficiently. And it's the myelin that gives uh, white matter its color. And then each part, and like I haven't even mentioned glial cells yet, but each part of this configuration that works together that governs all of our, our sort of brain activity and help make a sense of the world around us, like we usually consider that collection of configurations, the connectome, which is really about how all of these neurons um, uh, work together. Uh, so they could have just said that in the movie, but they didn't. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it's pretty easy to just, you know, grab a brain out of a jar and shove it in a body. So makes sense. Scientifically accurate. All right. <laughs> so lightning is a big part of how Dr. Frankenstein brings the creature to life. But what is it actually? Well, as he correctly points out in the movie, it's an electrostatic atmospheric discharge. Basically, two regions in, in the atmosphere or ground get electrically charged and tempor temporarily equalize their charge, causing the instantaneous release of as much as one billion joules of energy. Uh, this discharge then produces all kinds of electromagnetic, ra electromagnetic radiation, uh, including visible light that we see as the lightning bolt, as well as very hot plasma from exciting uh, the electrons in the air. It also creates thunder, as we know, uh, which is just the sound of the shock wave that's created by the discharge suddenly increasing the local atmospheric pressure. Now, the details of how clouds and how storm clouds get charged is still being uh, studied, but there's sort of general agreement on the basics. Uh, the main charging area in a thunderstorm is in the central part of the storm cloud, where the air is moving upward rapidly. That's the updraft. And the temperature ranges from about minus 15 to minus 25 C. So in that area, the temperature and the air movement produces a mixture of small ice crystals, which are very light, and those get blown upward. Those are little snowflakes in the animation. They get blown upward by the updraft. And then uh, also uh, created is something called graupel or soft hail, which is a fun new word that I learned recently. Uh, this graupel is larger and denser, so that tends to fall down. Those are the sort of uh, white circles in that animation. And so this movement leads to collisions between the ice crystals and the graupel, and those collisions actually lead to charge exchange, where the ice crystals become positively charged and get pulled up, and the graupel gets uh, negatively charged and pulled down. And so you have that difference of charge, you have the positives at the top and the negatives at the bottom, and that difference of charge, once it gets big enough, will eventually try to equilibrate, and that's where you get lightning. And so what about getting energy out of lightning? Uh, I said before that the average lightning bolt has a billion joules of energy in it. And that may sound like a huge amount, a billion is a big number, but it's only about the amount of energy the average American household uses in a week. Um, however, in a lightning bolt, all that energy is released in a millisecond or, or less, not over a week. So it is a lot of power, um, but to use it, you gotta capture it somehow. And we can also talk about what kind of power it actually is. And so while he wasn't the first to prove it experimentally, Ben Franklin famously showed that lightning is the same as electricity during his famous kite and key experiment. Uh, the details are often exaggerated, but it is a real experiment. It did happen. Um, Franklin wrote about it at the time. Other contemporary scientists that he told about it wrote about it at the time. Uh, it did involve a kite. It did involve a key. Um, but there was also a small lightning rod on the kite, which actually helped protect him. Um, he also hooked it together with a hemp string and a silk string, and he used his son uh, as his uh, assistant. So I don't know what his son's name was. I hope it was Timmy, so it's time to get a new Timmy if he gets electrocuted. 
But anyway, uh, neither of the Franklin boys were actually struck by lightning or electrocuted. None of that part of the story that you might have heard is true. Um, but what did happen was the hemp string and the key did get electrically charged by that difference in uh, charge in the storm cloud before the lightning uh, struck. And it became charged enough where uh, Ben Franklin got a shock on his knuckle when he put it close to the key, which is what's actually portrayed uh, in this painting uh, not long after that time. Uh, yep. So he doesn't get shocked by lightning. He actually put his finger near the key and got a little bit of a shock. Uh, and that uh, once again showed that that lightning is electricity. Uh, can we talk about this painting for a second? Um, <laughs> this sure. heroic painting where he must have convinced at least three children to hold this thing so that he could <laughs> shock them. And for some reason, they don't have clothes. I mean, they're they're the cherubs of science. I don't know. It's art. I don't really know. <laughs> All right. So what about getting life out of lightning? Well, enter these guys. Uh, on top, we've got Harold Urey. On the bottom, we've got Stanley Miller. And in 1952, while at the University of Chicago, they conducted one of the most famous experiments in the history of science, known as the Miller-Urey experiment. Um, and here's a, a cartoon of the apparatus for that experiment. It consisted of a five liter sterile glass flask on the left there that was filled with water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. And it was connected by these tubes uh, to a half liter flask full of pure water uh, down in the bottom right there. Uh, the water in the smaller flask was heated to create steam. And then electrical sparks were fired between two electrodes in the bigger flask uh, to simulate lightning. And so the mixture was then cooled uh, below that bigger flask there uh, so that it could condense and get trapped in that little U-shaped tube at the bottom of the apparatus. And that's the kind of, that's the output that they would sort of study. And so after a day of running this experiment, heating the water and uh, continually shooting sparks into that bigger tube, the solution collected in that trap at the bottom turned pink. And after a week of continuous operation, this solution turned deep red. And they found that the color change was due to amino acids, the building blocks of life forming in the apparatus. Uh, initially, Miller identified five amino acids in his paper from 1953. Um, but in 2007, they, they still have the original apparatus. You can go see it in the museum in Denver, actually. Um, but in 07, they re-examined the apparatus with uh, modern technology and found more than 20 different amino acids uh, in this apparatus, uh, more than uh, the number that naturally occur in the genetic code. And so basically what's going along here uh, or going on here is they simulated conditions of what we think the early Earth was like before life evolved. And by combining a few inorganic molecules, heat and lightning, the system naturally created more complex molecules that could lead to life. So there we go. We got stuff that's dead plus lightning equals building blocks of life. Not bad. Um, but as with all things in big screen science, uh, they eventually lead us back to Matt Groening. Um, and so I want to relay the story of uh, Heads in a Jar because I can't watch this movie and not think about um, Heads in a Jar because I think so much of the experiment has uh, so much in common with this. So um, uh, I learned about this from actually reading uh, Mary Roach's book, Stiff, um, but there was a, a scientist, Jean-Baptiste Vincent Laborde, who actually pumped blood into the head of a criminal and was successful in getting the eyes to actually open up and the forehead and jaw to contract. Um, it is a very macabre experiment, but it was uh, done. And a number of surgeons um, over the course of history, by the way, that, that experiment in France was in the 1800s, a number of surgeons have used techniques to keep brain tissue alive ahead of surgery. Uh, famously, Dr. Robert White from Case Western Reserve University managed to actually transplant monkey heads to new monkeys. Um, you know, that sort of two-headed monkey paralyzed and, and so died thereafter. But it, it has happened. Uh, and when you start to look into uh, the idea of heads in a jar, it leads you to weird places uh, like this. Um, so there is a gentleman uh, by the name of Patrick Kelly that actually um, filed a patent in 1985 about this. And uh, uh, he there's a sort of uh, he goes under the pseudonym Chet Fleming, which, by the way, if your name is Chet Fleming, uh, it is a dead giveaway. That is not a real name. Um, and the patent was described in a book. I'm going to air quote that 
um, that is actually up on Amazon called If We Can Keep a Severed Head Alive. Um, and it's really a discussion of the patent. And because it's on Amazon, there are Amazon reviews for it. And uh, this review sticks out to me. Um, it is one of the most hilarious Amazon reviews ever collected um, for anything ever before. Uh, this is the actual patent. Um, and it is a figure of essentially creating this closed loop mechanism uh, to pump fluids um, a, and extract waste uh, a, that would mimic the blood, uh, the ar arterial and vein structure um, a, to essentially keep a head alive. Now, Patrick Kelly claimed that this would work. Um, and that there was a, you know, a filter involved that could uh, take out carbon dioxide and other waste products. Um, and that he claimed that you could actually um, extend this patent to create an area that would push um, air through a modified trachea and produce a voice. Uh, now, sadly, uh, this patent has never been realized in a commercial product for some reason until this is a paper that came out just over um, a year ago. I, I guess it's almost two years old now. Um, it, it garnered a lot of scientific attention because it's literally about reanimating dead brain tissue in pigs. Now, here's what the diagram from the paper actually looks like. It is not dissimilar to the, uh, to the diagram from the patent. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I think about it this way. It is essentially a dialysis, ma dialysis machine. It's so they what they did was they created a complex set of pumps and filters that circulated a solution throughout uh, a pig brain with the goal of restoring circulation and supplying oxygen and other nutrients to the tissue while preventing the buildup of, so of toxic substances. So what they did was they found a USDA approved food production facility. They would get a uh, pig brain from it. USDA approved facility, obviously. Yes. Yes. Uh, what did I say? Yeah, I, I just mean that you have yeah. to. You got to go to. Yeah. You yeah. Re has to be reanimate a pig brain. You go to a USDA approved facility. Well, li like literally the reason they did it is they didn't want to be accused of killing pigs for the purposes of science, um, sadly. So what they did was they took these pig brains that were dead for about four hours and put them in this machine. And the solution that they would sort of pump through, they'd have a control solution that was essentially a buffer solution. And it had like some saline and some stuff. And then a solution that they put like vitamins, amino acids, some inorganic salts, some antibiotics, some metabolic factors, um, and some protective agents that would sort of help uh, prevent cellular decay. And they would pump it for about six hours and then they would image the brain tissue to see what you get. And here's what the paper found. So this is a, uh, a cross section of the neuronal tissue in the brain that um, is known to be pretty highly susceptible to oxygen and blood loss after death or a stroke. So um, the first image is from one hour uh, the second would be 10 hours. Uh, the third image is from the control. And the third is with the solution going through the brain X. So what they're essentially saying here is they're able to take the slice, stain it. And they found that the brains that have been perfused with this, what they called a brain X uh, solution, were comparable to the brains that were removed from the skull only about an hour after death. Whereas the cells from the other groups showed a lot of deterioration. Next, they actually looked at the glial cells, which are these cells that surround the neuronal tissue. Um, and they are, uh, glial cells are important for a lot of things, but they're uh, important for uh, providing like protection and support for the neurons. So if glial cells degrade, we think neurons will degrade as well. And so what they found is pretty similar for this. Uh, they per the brains that were perfused with the brain X solution showed staining similar to the brains that were only taking about an hour after death, while the brains that had received the control solution that were taken about 10 hours after death showed some fragmented uh, signals with signs of cellular deconstruction. So all of this to say is what they found is that this like pumping of a solution through the brain tissue was able to mitigate what the structural loss of having oxygen and blood supply to the structure would be. 
Um, does this mean that they maintain function? Uh, who knows? They weren't able to actually tell that. But this is literally a future, uh, like a patent that a, a stupid joke in Futurama is based off of, like come to life. And we have now gotten, what, like 15 slides into this, all based off of the idea of a closed loop system. We've had one scientific theme running through this entire theme. Uh, and uh, to Marlene's uh, point, is this useful? I don't know, but it's actually a, a really cool experiment. I mean, if we want to make reanimated pig creatures, this seems like the way to go. Also, can I mention really quickly, Brain X? I think they needed a little more time thinking about that one. I think they could have done better. I think they could have done better. All right. Uh, let's put that gross biology to the side for a little <laughs> bit and talk about, well, still some brain stuff, but we'll take a little bit of a detour with our friend William Congreve. Uh, so we repeatedly see people in the movie play music to call the creature back or calm him down and relax him. This idea, you know, could come from the quote uh, from English playwright and poet uh, William Congreve, music see soothes the savage beast. Uh, actually, that's a bit of a misquote that's become popular uh, these days. The actual line from his work is music hath charms to soothe a savage breast. Uh, it's basically the same idea, uh, but, you know, we sort of messed it up over the last few hundred years. Um, as I was researching this, this guy actually had a number of quotes that we use these days, but have kind of bastardized over the last few hundred years. Um, he originally wrote the line that we now say, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Uh, and he also was the one to write the line about you shouldn't kiss and tell. Uh, so a weirdly prolific writer of, I don't know, modern phrases that we've sort of corrupted over the time. Anyway, back to that first quote. Can music really sue the savage beast? or breast, or, or whatever? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, I think people sort of intuit this, um, but there's actually been a, a number of scientific studies uh, around this, of people's uh, physiological reaction to music. Uh, so one study was performed by uh, a team led by Dr. Michael Miller uh, at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, his team found that while people listened to music that brought them joy, they had increased blood flow as detected via a blood pressure monitor. So a very uh, simple experiment. In 2013, uh, this paper that I'm showing here was published uh, on the neurochemistry of music, uh, where the authors uh, performed a large meta study and found that music can divert the brain's attention giving one a break from repetitive thoughts and judgments, and that it can reduce stress and anxiety, and even in uh, patients while undergoing surgery. And so they will, uh, uh, you know, play calming music even during surgery, even when you're, you know, out under anesthesia, it still seems to have a calming effect. There's been studies that have linked music to uh, enhancing immune function, stuff like that. So pretty impressive. Oh, we, we get a pause because yeah. Washington pointed out the funniest thing ever that one of the researchers named Mona Lisa and that's just hilarious to me uh Mona Lisa Chanda is the first author of this study yes there we go <laughs> uh presumably uh some kind of doctor PhD MD or otherwise okay uh moving on to some other interesting studies around music and their effect on people uh, perhaps unsurprisingly for anyone who's here to a truly moving piece of music, uh, brain imaging studies have shown that music works at a very deep level within the brain. Uh, it stimulates not only the regions responsible for processing sound, but also ones that are responsible for emotions. Uh, so in 2016, Mind Lab International, which has a very funny looking website, um, conducted a study of people's reaction to a wide variety of music. And they actually put together a Spotify playlist of the world's uh, most stress-reducing songs that they found from their study. Uh, here is the link. If you search Spotify stress-reducing songs, you will find it. They claim in their study that the world's most relaxing song is Weightless by Marconi Union. Uh, I listened to it. Uh, here's a clip for uh, an image from the YouTube video and the link to the YouTube official music video. Uh, it is an eight minute nature sound filled ambient tune uh, that totally stresses me out. Uh, I dislike nature sounds, ambient music, uh, that whole genre. I don't like them. It makes me tense and freaks me out. So this is the exact opposite. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer like West Coast and West Coast jazz and bebop when I'm getting a massage, not this world music and ambient nature sound stuff. So Wait this doesn't work well. Wait a minute. 
nature sounds stress you out? Like the sound of like a it. babbling brook stresses I don't, you out. It makes me want to pee. I don't like it. <laughs> but peeing's not a stressful thing. No, but like if you're getting a massage, if you're in like a relaxing place, you don't want to usually pee yourself. I mean, if you're in a hot tub, maybe fine. That's accept that's socially acceptable already. But <laughs> Okay. Uh not getting in a hot tub with Jeff anytime soon. Cool. I learned that new. Let's move on to something that caught my eye uh, on the last couple of rewatches. There's this odd special thanks to someone named Kenneth Strickfaden in the credits. And at first I was like, oh, that seems like kind of a weird Mel Brooks, you know, wink at the audience joke, but it's totally legit. Uh, here is the aforementioned Ken in his younger days and then later in life. And he was actually the designer of the electrical devices in the Franken in Frankenstein's lab in the original Universal monster films in the 1930s. Uh, he also worked on sci-fi and horror props in over 100 other films and TV shows from the 30s through the 70s, uh, including The Wizard of Oz, The Munsters, lots of famous stuff. And so apparently, when Mel Brooks was preparing for Young Frankenstein, he discovered that Ken was still alive in the early 70s and living in the Los Angeles area. So he paid him a visit and found that he actually stored some of the original Frankenstein lab equipment in his garage. And so he made a deal to rent the equipment for the movie and gave Ken Strick Faden the screen credit that he never actually got for the original Frankenstein movies. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so cool. So yeah, impressive stuff in those scenes. Uh, and there's some of the originals. All right, I said this during the show. This is my absolute favorite part of the entire movie. Uh, it's so good. Putting on the Ritz. And yes, while we may not be able to reanimate dead tissue uh, to be able to do dance routines yet, maybe someday we can have dancing pigs, perhaps. Uh, we do have the current technology to build robots that have all kinds of sweet dance moves. And so, you know, maybe maybe we can get all of them to, to have a big uh, dance together. So this, of course, is a, a recent video from Boston Dynamics. Uh, it's a bit scary, but uh, those robots got some sweet ass moves. So, you know, we can, we can enjoy uh, these for a bit. <laughs> so when I was looking at this uh, earlier, somehow i i started it in a way that they kind of synced up really well it's not as as well synced this time but it synced up to where they're doing like the tap stuff on cue with each other and i was like oh no oh now the dog's in here then yeah i'm like oh i know this is just my human brain trying to like see the patterns between the two but they line up weirdly well <laughs> I love this. I love this so much. I don't find this frightening at all. Five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> all right, Jeff. Oh, it's playing again. You don't know where to. Uh, I think it's time for what we've learned. So I think the first thing that I learned is that. Uh, beware the free section of Craigslist when it takes you to a dude's garage in L.A. Dangerous place. But there's interesting stuff that comes from it. There you go. Uh, I think we can agree our robot overlords overlords are going to be way more bene benevolent than the creature. But, you know, they might have equally good dance moves. So that's something. I, I, would, I would say they had slightly better dance moves. They just didn't have as good auditory cues. Um, <laughs> it... And then I, I think we just agree that fire's bad. Um, fire bad. Fire's fire's bad. Uh, what rating are you going to give this movie? I think we got to give it the uh, highest Mel Brooks rating possible. Uh, you know, for the late great Cloris Leach Leachman, uh, four badass Leachmans is what we're giving this film. That's uh, that's a pretty high rating. Uh, <laughs> R.I.P. Cloris Leachman, you're the best. Uh, that that picture, that jacket, well played. Well we played, have Cloris. no idea what this is from, but it <laughs> just seems pretty pretty great. <laughs> yeah. So we went with it. No, no reference, but it's awesome. Uh, I guess in two weeks, which would be March third, we are doing we are going to the Rock, um, 
And this is one Excellent. we have a ton of content for. Not only is it our second Nicolas Cage movie, which is content unto itself. Um, uh, I've been it's our first Connery doing... movie, I think. Oh, it is, isn't it? Awesome. Um, That's beautiful. We're going to have a ton of local references. I've done Science Nights on Alcatraz. I'll have a lot to say about Alcatraz itself. Um, that movie is a lot of fun. Um it has some parts that are weird because it's you know it's the rock but it'll be fine it'll it's be gonna be it'll amazing be and there, you know there's weird um green orbs of goo that are somehow going to annihilate most of the weapon population. something or other yeah no problem it's should be actually a lot of fun thanks yeah. for sticking with us um through young uh frankenstein uh, and look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks for The Rock. Um, I'm thinking about doing a stream tomorrow for when Perseverance lands. Um, because, by the way, if you don't watch Perseverance landing tomorrow, if you're not like taking time off uh, off work, uh, the NASA stream starts at about 11.15. I think I'm going to fire up Twitch and do a live watch because it is going to be one of the monumental moments of science so probably around noontime i'm going to fire up the twitch stream and just have the nasa feed up and just kind of react to it um a, a about 12 55 pacific time ish we should be getting signals back from mars about whether perseverance landed successfully um but before i you know say my piece uh jeff as the astronomer like how how psyched are you tomorrow about um about the landing well very psyched i put it on my official work calendar as busy from 12 30 to 1 30. <laughs> so... oh i put i put do not schedule perseverance <laughs> seven exclamation points <laughs> yeah i i posted a message in our our you know work one of our work slack channels about our big screen science show as always uh and then yeah probably tonight i'll log in real quick and, and put a quick message about perseverance to remind people uh there's a lot of a lot of space nerds and and people interested in nasa stuff at my company they're always up for watching you know launches landings things like that so i'm sure there'll be a number of us watching uh from samba tv but uh yeah i'll probably poke into the uh the twitch stream quiche that'll be cool yeah and uh i mean obviously if you if you're free you can jump jump on discord and you can hop in and we can chat I, it's gonna be awesome um it, it's uh Seven years ago, like I think it was August 6th, 2012, is when Curiosity landed. Yeah, and, August 2012. I remember the day. Yeah. And um, just seeing, like, you know, Adam Stelter and the whole crew of people, Bobek, and a whole bunch of people have become friends since then. Um, it, it was kind of a it, an incredible triumph of science. I knock on wood. I mean, like, the failure rate for sending something to Mars is, is high. Um, so. Uh, knock on wood that everything goes well but tomorrow we should get that signal back i'm probably more excited about friday because that's when we'll actually get images and a movie quote unquote um which you know i i air quote it because it's going to be a series of kind of still images kind of stitched together as a movie and it's we're going to get a, a feel for what those seven minutes of terror are slightly different look like and jezero crater one of the more interesting areas on mars um so really excited about that. So it sounds like people are uh, into it. So I'll fire up the, the Twitch stream tomorrow and just have a, a feed of the NASA stream up and we can just chat along and uh, get nervous and get excited together about uh, what happens. Yeah, and if you don't want to hear us talk about it, yeah, uh, as pointed out in the Slack or in the uh, chat, uh, Exploratorium and Chabot, two awesome Bay Area science uh, museums, are going to be doing their own streams uh yeah nasa has its own stream so there's plenty of places to hear experts and fans talking about it uh it's gonna be cool for sure and then yeah like ashore said basically from here on there's gonna be lots of cool results you know probably almost daily coming out of the three different missions that are you know yeah. out at uh, mars now newly at we're mars. already starting to get some early results from the hope mission the which is the united arab emirates mission that that is a a probe that's in the atmosphere that's really just taking Im detailed images of the Martian atmosphere to try to understand how the climates change. Uh, but the Chinese rover, the Chanwen, is also, um, we should be getting data back from it um, 
uh, relatively soon. Um, Onikaze, it, it's Perseverance that has the the helicopter drone uh, ingenuity. Thing, yeah. uh, but that's not going to fire up for a little while yet. And even when it does fire up, it's mostly going to take test flights like within like a, you know like a uh tens of meters of of the rover just to see like can it actually pow- power up the its rotors can it go up and down before it actually flies anywhere i think the coolest stuff is going to come from the rover itself when it goes drills into um this area that had water in it and are there going to be signs of life uh, in that water i think you know the next couple years we're going to get some potential evidence around that uh if it finds something it's all like the probability is still all very low but they put themselves in a position to do it uh okay yeah. well i'll see a lot of people tomorrow <laughs> yeah uh, good for stuff. that and then in two weeks we'll see you back here for the rock because we're gonna break out Awesome. Thanks, everyone, um, for Again. sticking with us and uh, supporting us. All the proceeds from this event we we send over to the Alamo uh, Relief Fund and hoping that we'll all get into movie theaters again in the not-so-distant future. Uh, oh, I'll... Um, uh, Washington, that's a great idea. I'll hang out for a second. I'll raid um, our friend um, El Funko in just one second. It's just going to take yeah thanks everybody in. for coming in hanging out sticking around we had a pretty pretty solid crowd that stuck out like the whole time which is always nice to see everybody hanging out the whole movie and science presentation afterwards okay oh here's funko's stream we're gonna start rating over it's funko's birthday so everyone wish him a happy birthday uh and we'll see you tomorrow or if not then in two weeks uh and the raid should start in about five seconds so everyone great seeing you have an awesome night and see you guys soon uh did we go looks like it i still see us though i don't know all right